I'd like to introduce our first presenter for this afternoon session, Deacon Dave Bergeron, was born in Northampton, Massachusetts. In July, he will have been married to Deb for 36 years. They reside in South Hadley. They have a son, Matt, daughter-in-law, Valerie, and a grandson, Matthew. Dave was ordained a permanent deacon for the Diocese of Springfield in May 2017. He's also the pastoral minister at St. Patrick's in South Hadley. So please join me in welcoming Deacon Dave Bergeron. Applause and you haven't even heard anything yet. I'm in trouble here. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Wayne and, and Scott for all of their knowledge and their, and their beautiful witness and, and testimony here this morning. Um, I'm here to speak to you the, this afternoon on a parent's perspective of having a child who struggles and suffers with, with the disease of addiction. Um, but first I'd like to share with you um, that this disease, this illness never, never takes a break, it never goes away. Um, I was at a wake just this past Tuesday for a young man in our community. His mother is a parishioner at St. Patrick's where I'm the deacon um, and she lost her son at 21 to the disease of addiction, um, a drug overdose. And going to that wake and just seeing the family and, and trying to, you know, there are no words really in that instant all we can really do is is be present to them and it was particularly difficult for me while I didn't know the young man really well um, I knew his two older sisters and I had actually baptized several of their children to which this young man was a godfather to one of them um, and I think that's a big part of what we as a community of faith and believers need to do is to be present. Sometimes it's not what we say, but what we don't say, and just being able to, to listen to our, our brothers and sisters that are on this journey. Um, but I'd like to begin really with a, with a passion, passage from scripture, because scripture, the Bible is filled with passages and images of addiction and recovery and what that what that is what that looks like and this one for me is very telling and very striking it's from the gospel of matthew while he was saying these things to them an official from the synagogue came forward knelt down before him and said my daughter has just died but come and lay your hand on her and she will live Jesus rose and followed him, and so did his disciples. A woman who had suffered from hemorrhages for 12 years came up behind him and touched the tassels on his cloak. She said to herself, if only I can touch his cloak, I will be cured. Jesus turned around and saw her and said, courage, daughter, your faith has saved you. And from that hour, the woman was cured. When Jesus arrived at the official's house and saw the flute players and the crowd who were making a commotion, he said, go away. The girl is not dead, but sleeping. And they ridiculed him. When the crowd was put out, he came and took her by the hand and the little girl arose and news of this spread throughout all that land. Certainly has a, has a parent no parent that I know of wants to be a part of the particular group that my wife and I are a part of. Who wants to be in the group of, uh, who has a child who struggles with substance abuse or addiction? Nobody wants to be a member of that group, but that's where we found ourselves in 2012, 2013. Um, and there had been signs there before that we either chose not to see or didn't see or ignored or it'll go away or it'll be fine um, or my son would never do you fill in the blank. Um, but of course we know that that's not the case. 
it became glaringly obvious to me that it was really laid out before me. I had come home from a meeting on a Friday evening and my wife said, something's not right with, with Matt. Something's not, he's just not right. He was in his room, but something wasn't right. And I says, oh, okay. And we had an idea that he was at least using marijuana and we weren't sure what else, but we didn't want to believe what else. Um, so we'll just keep an eye on him. I went downstairs to get something to eat and I heard, David, David, get your ass up here right now, get up here. So I ran upstairs, what's going on? And in our bathroom, in our bathroom, were two syringes right on the vanity. I couldn't deny it any longer. Couldn't deny it any longer, you know. And as a parent, you know, you can't, when they reach a certain age and they fall down and get hurt, you, you put a Band-Aid on it, you know. You can't, couldn't put a Band-Aid, try as I might. We tried for, a long time to put a Band-Aid on it, you know, uh, ignoring it, it'll go away. He, he won't do it again. And we really become, we really become part of that first step in the 12-step program. Our lives as parents of those who have children who struggle with addiction, our lives become just like theirs. Unmanageable, ridiculous, we do anything to try to save them, to help them. You're looking at someone who quite literally nearly loved his son to death several times, several times by trying to, by trying to help until you realize that as they tell you so beautifully that you didn't cause this illness, you can't cure this illness, and you certainly can't control it. You can't. But until then, you can make yourself crazy, and, and I know, I, I lived it, I lived it. Um, my wife certainly got off that, I like to call it an enormous hamster wheel, much, much sooner than I did. She would say, can't you see what you're doing? And yeah, but if, we, if I don't do this, he's gonna die. If I don't do this, he won't get the help that he needs. And she would always tell me, you can't do it for him. You can't. You can't. It took me a long time to get to that point. And I can't say enough, there's at least one representative from the Parent Support Group of Western Mass who's here. They meet Wednesdays from 6 to 8, right in the Catherine Horan building of what was the old Providence Hospital. We walked into that thinking we were the only ones who had this problem this, that faced this stigma and we walked into this room of non-judgmental people who knew exactly where we were where we were coming from and they gave us some tools and knowledge mostly they let us know that we weren't alone oh my gosh and again but who wants to be a member of that group but I can honestly sit here and tell you or stand here and tell you today that those people are the most loving caring individuals that I wish we never had to meet and I'm sure they would agree, you know, because again, who wants to be a part of that, of that particular group? But I still, I still wasn't able to, to, to let go of, of some, to hand him over completely to, to God. And, and he's God's anyway, you know, I can't, I get an image of my mind when I look back now, um, if you've seen the movie, The Passion of the Christ, when Jesus is walking to Calvary and he, and he meets his blessed mother, he meets Mary, and Mary has a flashback of when he was a little boy and he trips and falls and she runs out and, and scoops him up and she knows in that moment she can't do that for him. She can be there for him, be present for him, but that's about all she can do. And as a parent of a child who suffers with this illness, that's all we can do is try to be present for them. And I can remember exactly where I was, exactly where I was when I was able to, to release him, to hand him over and say, okay, God, he, he was yours all along, but I can't, I can't do this anymore. Because if I continue on this road, it's gonna destroy him, and if it does, well, but it's gonna destroy my marriage, my, my life, and because that's the kind of disease this is. 
It doesn't care who you are or what you do or what you don't do, what background you have, it will, it will destroy everything if, if we allow it to, if we allow it to. I was just finishing up my, my first year of formation in the diaconate program. It was Holy Thursday and my son was away at, at detox and I was sitting before the altar of repose after, after the service being very angry with God, full of, full of that self, you know, pity. Just very angry, confused, hurt, not knowing what to do, thinking it's not supposed to be like this. This isn't how it's supposed to be. And I quite literally felt a hand on my shoulder, quite literally. And it was a fellow parishioner who had a daughter who struggled with the disease of addiction and she slid herself into the pew next to me. And in that time, I don't know how long we were there, but in that time, we talked and we cried and we laughed and we were Christ to and for each other. And I was able to say, he's, regardless of what happens, he's, he's yours because I can't, I can't do this anymore. And I'm not meant to do it. I'm not meant to do it. Getting back to the scripture passage that I read really helps me identify what someone who struggles with the disease of addiction is going through, but also those who love them, their parents or grandparents or siblings, in that woman who suffered from hemorrhages, she was a social outcast at the time, unclean, living outside of the community. Who knows the last time anyone saw her? And in that beautiful line, Jesus turned around and saw her. Saw her for who she was. In her pain and in her suffering, your faith has saved you. Your faith has saved you. And in that synagogue official, what kind of parent wouldn't do all that they could do for their child? Most synagogue officials during Jesus' day weren't going to come and throw themselves at the feet of Jesus and for any reason. I can't do this. I can't help her, but you can. You can. Certainly this illness, there's a physical component, as we heard so beautifully and wonderfully expressed. There's a physiological component, but there's also a spiritual component to it. And oftentimes I think that's what's, that's what's missing and that's what we has, as a people of faith can help with can help with, to journey with our sisters and brothers and their loved ones who, who struggle with this, with this disease and, the, and this illness. And sometimes it's not even a matter of saying anything, but just a matter of being present to them. Just being present to them. My son came home from detox because he had a court date my wife picked him up the following Tuesday after Easter and he had a court date on Thursday. And we went to court with him. When we first started going to court, they do, if any of you are familiar, they do case after case after case after case. And my wife and I were shocked because people would get up and there'd be nobody there with them. And I'm like, how can nobody be there for these people? But if you get knocked down enough by people, now I can certainly see why nobody shows up. No family members are there. I'm tired of getting stepped on and kicked and trampled on. I can't do it anymore. So my son came back and he had a day and a half, went to court. Thank goodness the judge, first thing she says is, well, you're gonna go to the, with the bailiff to, to give me a sample. And of course, well, I was away at detox. And, and, and the judge said, well, you, you shouldn't have a problem then, should you? And of course, he tested dirty. Of course. And the judge, 
in her insightfulness, said, well, obviously to me, to her, that you're a, a harm to yourself, so you're going to be held at the Hamden County Jail until your next court date, which was about eight weeks away, something like that. I can stand here and tell you that those eight weeks saved my son's life. I can stand here and honestly tell you that. If he had just, okay, we'll, we'll see you next time, and he went back out on the streets, he most likely wouldn't be here. It absolutely saved his life. He was court ordered to attend a six to nine month program. And as anybody from the parent support group or any other types of groups, try to find a place. Try to find a place to send someone who struggles with this illness. It's hard, it's hard to find a place, a bed anywhere. The last place and she just stood on her head for him, his probation officer. She found a place at the Salvation Army Adult Rehabilitation Center in Springfield right on Liberty Street. It wasn't ideal, but I, I went and had a, a lunch with him and then dropped him off just with the clothes on his back. And he did, he completed a, a nine month program there and my wife and I would go visit him on occasion. He was there probably two months, two months before he said, you know, I really think I need to be here. Or on the, my, I can remember on the drive home, my wife's like, well, duh, no kidding, no kidding. But it takes that long, it takes that long to get rid of that fog, that haze, that drug brain, that lizard brain, I think as Father Richard Rohr calls it, that lizard brain. So he completed the program. They asked him if he wanted to, to stay on, so he did. He drove trucks for the Salvation, you know, those Salvation Army trucks as he go along, and he did that for a while. Then he transitioned to a, to a sober house in Springfield. And now he's happily married as a three and a half year old, and he'll be nine years clean and sober next month. So, and doing what he needs to do for, for, for himself, for himself, because again, we can't, we can't do it for him. You know, and along this journey, I can stand here and tell you again, as a, as a parent, and I can't begin to speak for anyone else, but I'm, I'm not the same person that I, that I used to be. I can never look at someone who struggles with any addiction the, way, the same way ever again. As a matter of fact, I can stand here and tell you, and again, I'm ashamed to say it, but I was one of those parents who, who knew parents who had children who struggled with the disease, and I would say, I wonder what the hell they did. They didn't do anything. They didn't do anything. They didn't do anything. And the larger picture is, is that God can open up to us to other opportunities in which we can serve our sisters and brothers who are in this journey. As I mentioned, my son spent about eight weeks at the Hamden County Jail, so we went to see him a couple of times and it's no fun. I don't know if any of you have ever had to visit anyone in jail or have been in jail, but it's no fun. It's no fun. But now I fairly regularly go and assist the deacon, Deacon Paul Mazzarello, up at the Hampton County Jail with his communion service, or I've gone there to talk to um, parishioners in our parish who have who've had grandchildren that have been in jail for whatever reason. I never would have done that if I hadn't been there, hadn't had this opportunity, for lack of a better word, for lack of a better word. And I think that's what we're being offered this weekend. Somebody asked, I think it was Peggy asked, asked Scott, you know, what, what do I say, what do I do when, when someone asks, you know, I'm struggling with this or I have a loved one who struggles with this disease. And we're learning that now and hopefully we can all be part of that greater that greater conversation 
you know, because it's really about just being present to our sisters and brothers on this journey. Sometimes it's not a matter of saying anything. It's not a matter of saying anything. I also know, and it's always in the back of your mind, if you're a parent of, or you have a loved one who struggles with this disease, it's almost like you're waiting for the other shoe to drop. You know, every time my son and his wife are late for something, you go, oh no, what happened? I mean, it's not that we, I think about it all the time, but it's, it's there. But I've also learned and realized that that's his, not mine. He knows we're there for him, but he's got to be the one to do the work. I can remember the conversation like it was yesterday having with my son, saying to him, I think he came to ask for gas money, and I says, no, I'm sorry, Matt, those, those, that's, that's done, that's, that's over. As a matter of fact, your mother and I have decided that you, you know, if you're going to continue this behavior, you can't stay in this home anymore, in this house anymore. What do you mean? You have to go. You have to go. Because I can't, if you're going to destroy yourself, there's nothing I can do about that. I says, but if you stay, you're going to destroy our marriage, and we can't have that. We can't have that. So he lived in his car for a while, and couch surfed and, and, and all of that. But there's something very freeing about being able to do that. It's not my responsibility. It's not my to fix. I can't fix it anyway. As I like to tell people, I can barely go on the newspaper myself. I can barely go on the newspaper myself. I can't tell anybody else what to do or what to fix. And so he's doing what he needs to do for himself. And I'm very grateful for that because those who know anything about addiction, as Dr. Wayne, I think, even referred to the brain, the brain doesn't forget. The brain doesn't forget. I know people who have been in recovery, who have been sober for 34 years, and then for whatever reason, he said, walking by the liquor store or, or smelling beer or whatever, and they're right back at it after 30-something years. So it doesn't go away. But again, that's his, that's his, that's his journey. And I can support him as much as I can, but I can't do it for him. So I would urge any of you who are parents or loved ones who have those who struggle with this disease to, as much as you're able to, to hand it over to, to God. They're not yours to fix. They're not. And we can't anyway. And you will make yourself crazy. Trust me, I was driving the crazy train. I was. I was. And it's my hope that from this symposium and hopefully in the future follow-up meetings and dialogue and things of that nature that we can have individuals in our communities, in our diocese, in our deaneries, in our parishes that can journey with individuals who struggle with this disease and particularly with those who love them. To be able to give the information that Scott and Dr. Wayne so eloquently shared with us, we don't have to know all the answers, but hopefully we can at least point people in the right direction and just listen and be present and be present. That's really, that's really I think, all, all Jesus wants us to do. He wants us to love each other and he wants us to be present to each other. And it's my hope and prayer that we will be present to our sisters and brothers who struggle with this, with this disease and this illness. And that's my story. Thank you all for listening. <laughs>